Hello, everybody, and welcome to another There's a Will. Yes, I am wearing a hat. And before I'm attacked uh, by Nicholas Richardson, who's sitting to my right, I just want to say that I'm suffering from the same disease as Will Smith's wife. Why did she wear a hat? She has onomatopoeia. Really? And I'm shy to show my... I see. So you're hiding under your hat? Yeah, onomatopoeia. Yes, of course. You're well, hiding onomatopoeia under your hat? Yes. yes. Which dong or ding? Yes. Yeah. I didn't think onomatopoeia is not the word you're seeking. It's not? <laughs> No. No, it's, it's ding dong. That's onomatopoeia. So I'm yeah. asking which one he's hiding under the hat. Oh, it's ding dong. Is onomatopoeia? Onomatopoeia. Yes, yes. Yes. I thought that was what. No, aphasia is what she has. That's Maybe, what. Yeah. I don't have that yet. Well, that means you have to wear a baseball hat, doesn't it? Aphasia is what I have because I have to keep my brain warm. Ah. It's caused by cold, cold uh, cranium. I see. Have you ever? Have you ever? No, aphasia read is what Bruce Willis has, I think, but I forgot. I can't remember. <laughs> but. Have you ever read Terry Pratchett? Uh, yes, I have, actually. Why, you ask? Why? Because in his books, trolls needed to put ice on their head to think properly. Needed to put so ice on their head? The other way, ice. Uh, ice. To cool down their heads. To yeah. cool down their heads. Well, I, uh, we have some... I had to... I mean, Nicholas had his head in a bucket before. I, that must be why. <laughs> Because he's red hot yes. in the thinking department, aren't you there? Well, I try to be. That's Nicholas Richardson to my right. Of course, no relation still. We're still looking and hoping, folks, hoping, hoping, hoping <laughs> that there will uh, be some kind of link, but, uh, uh, even ancient, between us. Um, uh, uh, Anthony, we have uh, Anthony McFarlane on the line from, from Bidgosh, is it? Are you in Bidgosh there? I think you are. I have a Scotty in the back. Yeah, you got the Scotty. Okay. And from beautiful, uh, the beautiful suburbs of Bialystok, we have uh, Olga Mujimbo, <laughs> which is easy for me to say. I've been practicing. I, I, had, to, I had to use some WD-40 on my mouth so that I could, you know, get loose enough to, to say. Well, it's, it's brilliant. The way you pronounce my name is, is brilliant. Yeah. Well, Thank you. I've been hearing that a lot lately, and I don't want to get too big a head over it. Another reason I'm wearing the hat. I have Remember, my when big I studied in China, I needed to make it really short, so I went for Olish because it's easy to remember. Olish, the Polish. And yeah. you're doing all get to Jembo thing. That's amazing. How can people say your name? Do you have t t trouble uh, besides with me, with other? I mean, probably Anthony's smart. He can say it very uh, Anthony can say Jimbo. it very easily. Uh, you know, I'm not testing you. I'm sure you can. I know that, that Nicholas, Nicholas can because, uh, obviously, a man of his talents. But uh, uh, it's, it's trouble for me. Do other mere mortals like me have trouble saying your name if they're not no, Polish? That's why during the scholarship I had to change it to Olish. Everybody remembers me from, as an Olish. As Olish and the last name? No, nobody bothered. They just remembered me as Olish. I'm not like Madonna kind of thing. You, you're a sting or Madonna, either one. I don't yeah. care. You can cross dress. We don't care. Yeah. Sometimes could, I do. Come hey, on, on this show, you can be whoever you want to be. All right? It doesn't matter. I was, uh, so t today I wanted to talk about uh, some of the things that are in the news. There's quite a lot in the news. Uh, there's a couple of big issues that we, you know, perhaps you read up on or listened up on a little bit. Um, Nikki, what's your impression of what's going on this week? What are the top, the top things that leap out in your mind? Well, in, in a world sense, obviously Ukraine mm. continuing. Um, a lot of people seem to be trying to forget about Ukraine, but it's still there, mm. very important. That's true. Uh, in particular, the expected sort of counterattack in the Kherson region, which has great significance from a strategic point of view because that's the biggest city north of the Crimean Peninsula. And at the moment, the Russian forces are divided either side of the Dnieper River. And of course, then the other thing is the continuing Chinese military exercises around about Taiwan, having finished one set in response to Nancy Pelosi's visit. They've now started another set because mm. they are a bullying totalitarian regime. Mm. And it doesn't matter what we do. They're still a bullying totalitarian regime. So we might as well be strong and protect our friends. 
Mm. That's if you wanted it in, in the summary. But um, people say, oh, ooh, Nancy Pelosi has provoked the Chinese. No, she hasn't provoked the Chinese. They, were, they, they are self-provoked. The fact we exist at all, other than to buy their manufactured goods, is a provocation. And, and pay the slave labor. And pay the slave labor, yeah. yeah. Um, so she did, actually, Nancy Pelosi is not really my cup of tea. But for once in her career, she appears to have actually done the right thing at the right time. So I will congratulate her for that and for not allowing herself to be dissuaded. Um, and the sort of half-hearted comments of the president, Biden, ridiculous, really. He makes the situation worse. If he'd said nothing and let her go, that would have been fantastic. If he'd said, yes, I support her because as Americans, we support our friends, that would have been even better. But instead of which, it was this nothing to do with me, mate, and the military don't like it. Exactly the sort of thing which has encouraged the Chinese to be even more vociferous than they were before. That's my view on the world's affairs of the, of the, current, the current week. Uh, 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 oh, Gerard, go ahead. It's just, I, 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 it's complete horse feces, the, the talking that Pelosi provoked China in any way. Because it, do you know that in our language and in Russian language, there is like the last uh, China admonition? It means some, somebody is saying something, uh, you know, to an, another country and never meaning actually to do it. So because threat, the threat. 1960s, yeah. China was like 156 times warning to the U.S. for protecting Taiwan. And they're still at the same place. And they're still at the same place. With Pelosi, Russian propaganda was, was like go, going berserk. They were happy. They were seeing the Third World War, atomic bombs landing on Taiwan, and nothing happened. Mm -hmm. So your opinion is that she did the right thing, like Nicholas? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, that she did the right uh, thing to visit. That should be doubled down by President Biden. That's yeah, but President Biden doesn't have a backbone to even stand behind some of his own in his, par, uh, his side of the government, hence his comments. That's the stupid part. He has no backbone. Well, That's what our enemies are taking advantage of, a weak president. You know, remember, it started with Afghanistan. I, I still think it's, uh, it's... I agree. I completely <laughs> agree with what Anthony just said. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, but, but not, not trying to cut you off, Will, but Oldyard pointed out something that's very good and it's actually something that uh, the retired general pointed out, that Afghanistan is probably the cause of the weakness that the world is seeing in the United States and hence why the provocation. The Ukraine incident or war that we have in our, in our hands right now would have not started if we were not to be that weak and looked upon weak in the Ukraine because we were supporting Ukraine in training for years in preparation for an possible invasion from the aggressor from the east. But unfortunately, with Afghanistan, what happened, all of our allies have looked at us as if we are not even capable of withstanding such a small and significant force, which is not an insignificant force, but a force that could not even have the capabilities that we have to fort them off. And then we just abandoned our ally and left them to flounder in the wind. That's what we're looking at. We, that's the impression that I have and that I'm not alone on that. Um, when you say you're not alone, you mean peers, colleagues, people yeah. with your level of experience, people yes. you're in contact with now, and your level yes. of experience. Although you may look young, you've seen a lot. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I, I wish, I wish my gray hairs say otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, the mistake made in Afghanistan was actually if I left, similar to the mistake made in, in, in Vietnam. You announce in advance a date when you're leaving, so your enemies just have to sit around making, enjoying a cup of tea, waiting for you to go. I mean, that's just fatal. Yeah. You uh, can say, I'm going to go when I've established basic democracy, when I've removed terrorists, then I will leave, and that's fine, because that's a date at some time, and people know, well, they're not going to get the better of you. But if you say, I'm going on whatever it was, September the 1st, or then they say, well, just wait till September the 1st. Oh, and, and it was all because the previous president... Exactly. Whose name I won't say, <laughs> yeah. in case it triggers people across the world. The previous president, Trump, there I said it. Yes, you said it. Yeah. And if I may just make one point uh, here, and one of the... I promised that we were going to get out. One so, of the sad, uh, we, I, the one of the sad ironies, if you think of the amount of kit the Americans left behind in Afghanistan, think what a difference that kit would have made in Ukraine. How a nation can leave billions of dollars of perfectly serviceable military equipment for its enemies to... OK, they had more difficulty flying the helicopters, perhaps, 
but they managed to fly a few. Um, and, and all those military vehicles left. And what a difference they would have made now in Ukraine. Well, yeah, it's just the, it's just the waste of it. Oh, well, it costs a lot to ship them uh, and stuff like, stuff like that. What do you think about that? Anthony, you, had, you were in close contact. It's been a long time since I was over there. But you were in close contact around this time. What, your, what, what, what do you say, sir? Uh, we created the world's most heavily armored Middle Eastern country that we have in the in that area because now they're actually probably stronger than Iran. Uh, they don't have the big enough air force, but they have a big enough ground force. Yeah, that's not the only thing we left. I mean, hell, we left stockpiles of weapons, stockpiles of money and money houses that they can actually fund their own stuff because they have. we left millions of dollars in houses that we had to pay uh, because those money was for not only operation missions, but also for humanitarian missions and continued infrastructure missions and that's just amongst the tip of the iceberg. We left everything. We dropped it. It was a... Why? <laughs> it wasn't necessary. Exactly. Why? What kind of leader does that? It's a sort of... It makes it's you want to beat your head on the wall. It's not a leader. That is just yeah. an ad hoc situation because his party was not happy with what was going on. They wanted to get the hell out of there, and I was it. That is... To me, that, that's, my, that's, what we, that's what I saw. That's what a lot of my peers see, and we're absolutely disgusted with it. Yeah. It's almost like we wasted our entire lives and almost put our lives on the line for absolutely nothing. Absolutely. 100% behind you on that. Yeah, the, for me, the saddest story is the Afghani people, the ones that felt freer because of the American presence, the, the women that could study, could go to school, and then Taliban insisting, no, no, we're not changing anything. We just don't let the girls study anymore. Yeah, no doubt. They, they basically took their principles and freedoms away. That, again, yeah. it's... Yes. Caliphate is an idiot. It's it, that we created a monster. It's one of the things that I, I don't even know how to say. I'm just disgusted with that situation. Yes. That, it's that. also and, and it's interesting when you think about the situation and the stated purpose for leaving. We must get out because we said we were leaving and we, we shouldn't be in this place anymore. And yet we've been, and it's been pointed out by others, I think it's worth stating again now, uh, we've been in uh, uh, the United States, not we, but the United States has been in so many countries since the end of World War II. It's one of the reasons the peace has been kept. And there have, have been hundreds of thousands of troops in Europe. There have been uh, troops in, in many countries throughout the world, Central America, to name a few. One of the largest bases is in, uh, sorry, uh, uh, embassies that America has is in Nicaragua, just outside Managua massive compound. Uh, you have, uh, of course, South Korea and many other places. We have a large uh, cooperation with many of our allies across the world, not to mention all the things that are going on in Africa that people don't actually know about. Well, that's it, exactly. But which are going on all the time. We've mentioned... What we've is happening to, in Congo? Do you so know So why do we have to get out of Afghanistan when we keep airports and bases and... Uh, and fortified embassies in so many places. That's a question I don't know if we can answer, but it's, it's one that books should be written about. Well, exactly. I mean, it, it depends how you, how you view these things. You say, well, look, we believe our way of life is best. It, it provides democracy. It provides the rule of law. It provides material benefits for our people. And sometimes that has to be protected by having a base in some far-flung corner of the globe because the majority of countries in the world do not enjoy those benefits. And the, certain of those countries, China, Russia, are determined to deny those benefits to the countries in their immediate vicinity, obviously, and to other countries in the rest of the world as well. So unfortunately, whether we like it or not, we have a duty, A, to protect our own way of life, but B, to actually, if you like, spread the gospel in terms of that this bring benefit to the rest of the world, because we have the talent and the ability to do it, so we must do it. That's our duty. Well, you also have a duty. This is a good point you raised. We, uh, about duty, but uh, and 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 previously what you were saying, the whole thing leading to that point. But uh, you, know, you also day, have a duty to take care of the weapons that you leave lying about. Well, of course you do. If we don't want to <laughs> intervene, that's fine. But once yeah. you've made the decision to intervene, yeah, then everything changes. Right. And you can't say, well, I'm going to intervene for three years while it's convenient, and I'll leave after three years. Because once you intervene, it might take 
three years. You may don't take know three how months. long it's going to take. It may take 300 years. We don't know. Yeah. But, and therefore, you, before you intervene is the time to make these decisions, yeah. not when you've intervened and now we don't like it very much. Yeah. We never should have given up that air base. Big mistake. No, that was a huge mistake. Could have kept that forever, and we should have, because it only leads to what, oh, good, leaving that base there and all these other things, that all these ma uh, material and money, monies that... That Anthony was talking. What does it lead to? It leads to the next door neighbors a coming things. in. Another another thing that is very interesting that you realize that in Soviet sorry, in modern Russia, uh, Taliban is actually outlawed, outlawed, outlawed. It's illegal, but at the same time they invite Taliban government to talk with Russia and they're really on good terms. Same with China. China invests a lot of Afghanistan, in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what they're doing with those armaments. Either they're being researched, either they're being copied. I don't know. Like, you you should ask probably some of Tony's friends. They would know better. Well, that, we, do, you, we do know, uh, Tony, what? you know about the place called Dara, right? In Pakistan, yeah. where they manufacture guns to order. Uh, I've been there. I don't know. Have you been there? In the no, I have not had the oh, chance to go back as that. You'd have enjoyed that. That's an education. Uh, Wild West town for sure, like something out of a Tarantino movie. But uh, there, they they said that they they famously supposedly copied to to to, to just to to add on to the point Ogird makes that they were copying even Stinger missiles there. Yes. Uh, you've heard that, Anthony? Is that right? Yeah, that's not the only thing they copied. Stinger missiles, they copied the uh, night vision scopes, they've also copied the thermal scopes that they get a hands-on that the soldiers leave when they get captured or they just drop. Um, this just opened up the door to the eastern munitions and eastern weapons and capabilities that the United States had and the Allies had to their enemies, potentially. And that's not only the only thing, I mean, how you just brought up a good point that Nick also put up, that it's opening the door to China and Russia to come in and take a, take a look at our weapons. For instance, look at the stealth fighter technology. Hell, when that F-17 crashed, F-117 crashed over, I think it was uh, you know, late August in 2012, I don't know if it was 2012, 2011, they got a hold of that technology and they immediately sold it to the Chinese and look what the Chinese did. And then the Russians all of a sudden came with stealth technology and then the Iranians came with stealth technology. So all the BRIC countries now have stealth technology because of that crash. So that's why it's we are doing our own selves in by not doing the right thing and bringing back the money. Yes, yeah, the weapons. Yes, it will cost a heck of a lot of money to bring it back, but it's a lot better and secure for us and our allies. But we didn't do that. Very good point. So what is the thinking of the people who are making these terrible decisions? Do you want the honest answer or the political answer? I want an honest answer and, we'll, and the political answer. All right, honest answer first. From, they from, okay. from any and all of you, yeah. They, they weren't thinking at all. They were using their background and their parties to push them to do the, uh, to the, do the wrong thing. The political answer is that they were trying to keep peace uh, because they were thinking about the elections and trying to keep others from actually doing the right thing and actually following what the American people should do. Because an example that would have worked in Afghanistan was Korea. There is no, paid. you're right, Anthony, I think, and there is no short term in imperial policy. <laughs> there no, cannot be. There cannot be. And the, the you studied people, military yeah. history. So it, has, uh, I know that so has Olgerd, and I know that so has Nick, and so have I. That was my special 18th linguistics. century history. And there can be no short-term thinking when you're an empire. They can't. No. That's what leads to disaster, not only for you, but for the power vacuum that you create. Well, it leaves disaster. By disavowing your responsibility. Particular okay. disaster in the short term for the people you've just abandoned. And I'm thinking particularly in the Afghanistani case, obviously translators who worked with the with the armed forces yeah. of whichever country, and then particularly people who were trying to rebuild civil society, like judges. There were a lot, for example, in Afghanistan, there were a lot of, we trained a lot of female judges. Yeah. And they are now under threat, one, for being women, and two, because they were judges. So we leave, we, oh, some of being, we've got some of them out, some of them we just seem to abandon. There was that terrible, terrible, terrible case last year of some jet being hired to remove a load of stray dogs. 
I mean, that was just the, an abomination. And anybody responsible for that should be taken out and horsewhipped when there were people who needed to the be brought dogs out. Dogs instead of people. Yeah, yeah. It, it just, it just, and that actually, in a way, typifies the stupidity and the lack of thinking at the top. Because we're now led in every country in Europe, it seems, and in North America, by people of very limited integrity, even more limited intelligence, who take the short-term fix to yeah. appease their political supporters, yeah. who represent a minority of thinking within the country, and a really perverted and strange minority at that, if I may say so. You I may can say on your so. program. You may but, say so. But it's true. It's, it, what it represents, actually, is Here decadence in the wider sense. Yeah. A ruling group in each country that has forgotten. Yeah. And because they be, if they become individually rich, that's it, they don't care. Yeah. So, sorry, just very, very briefly. So we have a situation where... We're, we're the, the, time, so the Supreme Leader of Iran, ahead. the Supreme yeah. Leader of Iran has a... Yeah. Has, a, has, a, um, has, a, has a Facebook account, which is operative, I believe. Yet the democratically elected president of the United States, one Donald Trump, had his removed. And everybody thinks, ha ha, hooray. But if I'm an Iranian mm. citizen, I can't be on Facebook. Plus, the FBI raided his house. Yeah, it's mean, the only president who's ever had his house I mean, the raided. The whole thing is, you know? uh, who gains from this? I'm not uh, saying. I, I want to come back to Anthony's yeah. point because Anthony really, uh, that's why I wanted him to. to I thought he was going to say something cogent, as he did. <laughs> he did. Uh, when, when you said that the, this short-term ex expediency, if I can translate it using that bit longer word, that uh, self-interest in the short run uh, was, was the reason for these bad decisions and political elections coming up, terrible reason to make strategic... Hopeless reason. ...decisions. You can't afford that when you're an empire. Okay, we got to finish on that. I'm sorry. We got to finish this half. We're going to come back and continue, and we're going to talk uh, some more about Ukraine and what's going on because there's a lot going on in Ukraine, um, and uh, it needs to it needs to be talked to at length. We're one of the few programs that really are doing that on a consistent uh, basis these days. Yeah. Okay, everybody, stay with us. Thank you for watching, and enjoy these messages. Welcome back to There's a Will. Hope you enjoyed those messages. We didn't see them, so we have no idea what they were. No, we don't. But I'm very, very curious. We'll have to ask sometime. Yeah. What are those mysterious messages? Yes, exactly. I hope it's not those uh, videos of your vacation. No, there were no videos of my vacation. You Fear know. not. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, not, not that you know about. No, I'm, I'm pretty certain. No, we sent a, we no. sent a little... You didn't, didn't hear about that? We sent a little crew along no, with you. you didn't. Yeah, you'll be getting, there's going to be a special program on that. Oh, good, okay. Yeah, and we're back <laughs> with Mick Richardson in the studio. And on the horn from Bidgosht is uh, Anthony Tony McFarlane Gonzalez, which is always fun to say. It's, uh, <laughs> if I said that fast a few times, it'd be a tongue twister. And the man whose name goes without saying, I hope. No, but I have to say it anyway. Olgird. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Back, everybody. Yeah, we were talking um, when we were off. We were talking about this visit to Africa and what's going on in Africa. The Russian Lavrov visited there, and uh, he's there, uh, Secretary of State and uh, foreign minister, if you will, and, and also some of the Chinese interests in Africa. Before we go back and talk about Ukraine, I think this is important. Um, Olga, do you, did you want to continue your point? Well, Maybe I was, Anthony I was just joined interested in? because uh, it, after Lavrov's visit, and he ran around a couple of African countries, actually many of those countries are uh, going to have a food crisis because of the Ukrainian war. That's one thing. And another thing, there's things started happening, like in Congo, for example. I'm not clear on what is going on in Africa. That's how I'll probably have to ask Tony. He, he'll know more about it. Yeah, Doc, the, the Congo right now is actually in a severe civilian uh, civil, civil war state, and they're actually the Russians are going in there for trying to stabilize them, quote-unquote. 
uh, pretty much help themselves along with the Chinese to resources. So they're pretty much going to manipulate and try and get the Congo to be on their side, which is going to have them already on top of the multiple bases that are there that they have in other countries. Another foothold in Africa, each one of them. So they have vested interest to get there. So that's one of the things that's going on. But the actual problem that the Congo is facing right now is the ADF or AFD or AED, whatever the heck they are called. They're pushing towards a civil war and they have war crimes that their civilians are actually telling them uh, ADF. So that they're telling that they're committing these war crimes. So it's constant back and forth. Uh, it's been going on since, uh, I want to say that, the seventh to the the last time that they had a killing that was reported by the ADF or that people suspect ADF was this past July, so the beginning of July, somewhere between the fourth and the the eighth, one of those few days in there, uh, with 15 people, of course, with infants. So it's more of a uh, ethnic cleansing kind of killings that they're doing, which is nothing unusual in Africa, but it's still absolutely atrocious to think about. It's sort of similar to what is going on in the Ukraine, if you kind of put relations to it. Yeah. And, and for me, it's an interesting because Russians are going together with Chinese, and I don't see them cooperating that well. No, they, they, they will not cooperate together. They've always constantly been at each other's heads and throats, but it's they're, they're putting themselves, uh, they're putting some of the bickering aside, even though they're still trying to. Why don't, get why don't they get along in, in this particular interest and, and others? Because uh, it's worth stating this practical way, this practical instance of them not getting along in terms of looking at the, the longer-term cooperation, because one of the greatest fears, of course, in Western Europe and the United States would be a unification of interests of Russia and China. And well, the, the trick is that they have really strong negative stereotypes of each other. They have been promoted in, in official language and in, in people's stories. And for me, you know, I'm a science fiction fan. It was this beautiful Chinese science fiction movie, The Traveling Earth. And in there, the, the Russian the, the, the Russian cosmonaut is po portrayed as a bumbling, drinking idiot. And it's like, yeah, that's the, the, the vision of, of Russia they have. Russians, on the other hand, they, they think Chinese are, are, are incapable of doing many things because they're purely a bit on the wild side, as heathens in 19th century, as, as, you know, as, as was the stereotype, colonial stereotype of Chinese. They still have it. And both countries are, are, are mightily racist which is not often mentioned. So it's, it will be difficult for them to work together in, part, in actual cooperation on the ground. Even though after the Pelosi visit, China apparently stepped up the military for help for Soviets, uh, for Russians. If we're going to say they're, if we're going to use the R word and say they're racist, might want to explain uh, in, in what ways, uh, Olgerd, being a man who has studied well, in depth that in the part of the world. The Russians, they think that the great Russia, the 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 the, the bless, blessing of humanity, they are the best, and they've been always stopped by some other, you know, degenerated races. And Chinese, they always think their culture, which is five thousand years old, is just the best on the on the planet. And culture, and because they're Chinese and they're racially Chinese, it is a pretty monolith country. It's ninety-two percent of Han Chinese in China. It's much more difficult in Russia, though, because Russia is has to survive on the less racist terms. It's more cultural, cultural. Um, I don't know whether we can still call it racism. Like Shoigu is definitely not Russian, ethnically, but they're still. Who, thinking who's that you mean? The general in charge. Is the general that who you mean? in charge, Shoigu, yeah, Shoigu. the, the, the yeah, deer hunter. Yeah. Right, general in charge of the Russian army, not ethnic yeah. Russian. Uh, no. But, you know, this, one of the things they said during the whole Soviet Union was, we're uniting all these different types of people. Um, and, the thing and that is, was always it, a, a Mongol type It is really thing. different now. Even though they're uniting different kinds of people, there is still this undertone of, of, of great Russia, uh, powerful great Russia, white Russia ideas. And, and the funniest thing is when the people who are the fighting— White, in white Russia refers to a part of Russia, not to Russia being— no, no, no. I'm, I'm, Color I'm, white. I'm, I'm, well, because people will make, might make that mistake. No, no. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the white Russia in, as in yeah. white skin color. Oh, you are in that sense? Yes. Yeah. Because the most absurd thing in the anti-Nazi 
campaign in Ukraine is that part of the voluntary troops that are fighting on the side of Donetsk and Lugansk are actually Russian nationalists with, with swastikas on their bodies as well. Yeah, that's... <laughs> because, I mean, I, excuse me, but it's absurd. It's just absurdity worthy of CAMA or UNESCO because uh, uh, of all this talk of uh, anti-Nazism and then the soldiers turning up with uh, happy to have swastikas and other kinds of uh, absurd symbolism. Yeah, uh, there is this whole the revival, uh, Slavic revival people who are using swastikas or swastika-related signs as their symbolism, and they're fighting on the Donetsk side. There is a whole battalion of them. At least was. I don't know how many uh, casualties they bore. I have no idea. Yeah, because, of course, they were saying the, the Ukrainians were like that. It's really, yeah, on, right. it's really on both sides, isn't it? Yeah. Well, more on the Russian side. And Sorry, even more on the Russian side. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll accept that. The, uh, we have to accept it. Probably true. But uh, moving on, there are a number of... Th the war is going on. The war has been pushed more and more to the back pages. And also <coughs> less and less, more, the more talk there is of the elections in the United States, the less they're talking about uh, Ukraine and the war that's going on there. And now the possibility of something else happening in China or certainly more tension. Um, isn't it a good time for Ukraine to make some moves? Because if you look at the map, I'm going to throw this over to Tony, but if you, uh, as our military expert, if, uh, if you look at the map, Tony, Kherson is a pretty precarious place to defend, isn't it? Yeah, it's extremely precarious because it's... The for, for the Russians, yeah. 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 It's a very big city. Uh, it has a lot of industrial areas that they can actually, uh, the Ukrainians can hold down. The Ukrainians are advantageous because they've held that city before. And it's going to be extremely hard for the Russians to maintain it, especially if the Ukrainians are able to defeat the Black Fleet. The Russians do not have that back support to help them out at all. Yes, and I mean. This active uh, underground army in Kherson, there are terrorist acts every now and then killing prominent Russian. Uh, Leaders. Russian administration people. It's kind of like the, you can kind of relate it to the Warsaw Uprising, but these are actually militia that are well-trained. Yeah. To the, to the Warsaw Uprising. Well-trained and well-armed, we, we can presume. Yeah, and well-planned, uh, with good planning. The location of Kherson is next to the river uh, there, the Dnieper, and you have one large bridge, right? One large bridge does the uh, entry point in and out, uh, but the the Russians have failed miserably to erect pontoon bridges uh, because of the disturbance from the Ukrainians are are pushing that back. But the one thing that is going to be hard for the Ukrainians to do to actually gain full control of Kherson is to put those pontoon boats, uh, pontoon bridges, to good use without being attacked by the Russians, which it's back and forth action between them both. So it's going to be very hard. It's going to be a hard fought fight there. So, uh, but the Russians are. Do the, do the Ukrainians need the pontoon bridges? Can't they come from the, of a different direction? The others could. cross the river higher up and come down that way. They could, but it's going to take legit. It's logistical. It's an, it's a logistics issue. It's logistically because, more difficult. Yes, because you got to move your troops. You got to move them with fuel. Uh, fuel is required for the vehicles. And not only that, but getting the uh, people there themselves, that's another tactical risk, moving those vehicles, that large amount of that convoy would be massive, and there would be different times you have to send different convoys to get them up there. So getting up to that bridge or getting closer to Kherson to buy that bridge with pontoon, you know, pontoon bridges would be the best and ideal thing to do. Apparently, Russian so army doesn't have that much pontoons to build a bridge. That's what I've been listening in on the yeah. Ukrainian sources. Well, they keep getting sure. destroyed as well when they do build them. <laughs> so they're running out of, again, here's another thing. Okay, so the counteroffensive around Kurzum, we're going to be watching that carefully. There's also another point about the fleet in Crimea. Now, Crimea 
I think we talked about this before, but the Crimea, Crimea itself is uh, rather heavily uh, Russianized, isn't it? Yes. Russified. Yes. Um, historically. Um, but that is where the, the fleet is located. There is some sense that they're going to use, that the Ukrainians will use these large Neptune missiles to take out more of the fleet. Um, it, it, what does that do for them if they take out the fleet at this stage? And there was another talk, not only fleet. Think about the Crimean Bridge. Uh, the one, the one that comes right, yeah, the one from Crimea yeah. right to the mainland. Exactly. Yeah. If you take that, I don't understand why that, that bridge hasn't been taken out. Does anyone understand why? Well, they don't have enough range. Yeah. They can't you, reach it. Yeah, but you no. go to a you, 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 but low you, level bombing run. Yeah, but you you raise the point, which has been the Ukrainian position from the very beginning. We can do all these things if we have the correct heavy weaponry. Which is what the Ukrainians have been pleading for since this 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 um, war began, and they could do all these things. The Ukrainians have the will uh, to fight clearly, and and to many people's surprise, they certainly have the ability to fight. What they are lacking are certain heavy weapons. I mean, look how the um, the uh, getting hold of the American HIMARS missile system had made a tremendous difference. The Russians now are where these weapons are being used by the Ukrainians are, 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 are falling back. They're completely defeated by them. Um, and so, you know, again, uh, the, the Ukraine would say, if they were here, yes, we can take out the fleet, we can do all these things, please, we've been saying, please send us the weapons that we need. Um, and people say, oh, uh, you know, at the beginning, oh, we can't send the Ukrainians weapons because it might lead to a war. Well, there's already a war going on. So the sooner we actually equip the Ukrainians and let them win it, the better we all are. Better off we all are, sorry. And I, it may yeah. sound very cynical, but, you know, we, it's best that you fight the war for freedom in somebody else's country, because that's where they suffer the so, death and destruction. So yeah. my view is that if we, you know, the sooner we actually give the Ukrainians what they're asking for, the better for everybody. Yeah. And the, the quicker this war will be brought to an end, with a result which suits us all in the, in the free world, for one. Uh, and, and so I, I, you know, the, the time for being reluctant about it has long passed now. And again, oh, you'll provoke the Russians. No, the, the, the Russians, the Chinese, these totalitarian yeah, regimes throughout the world yeah. are perfectly capable of provoking themselves. They don't need our help, and they're doing it anyway. So the sooner we mm -hmm. tell them no, like all bullies, then we have a chance of stopping them. Well, life's just not worth living if you're going to be bossed around. That's well, exactly. The, that's the point. So at, at what point do you just say, well, you know, bring it on? Yeah, exactly. Really? I mean, I'm not talking about nuclear war. I'm just about, you know, really? Exactly. You really want to do this? Exactly. Really? <laughs> no, I must say that yeah. the HIMARS are working really well because the, the Russians seems, seem to have real problems with their, with their munitions, with their uh, moving their troops, and it does work. Yeah, the, 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 fact, the, the mobility of these things, the destructive power and the mobility, uh, the destructive power of the range and the mobility is amazing. Of these, exactly. That, yeah. that's a mobile, a mobile artillery rocket system. That's why HIMARS is one of the most sought-after military pieces of equipment that the United States has, and that's why because they can easily park, shoot, move. And, and they... another thing that I learned from my Ukrainian friends, apparently the anti-air defense is getting really good in Ukraine, which was which is usually not mentioned, but it starts working much better. Well, that, that's, they... that's wasting those yeah. Russian missiles they're running out of anyway. But what about yep. people? Because the CIA estimate, their public estimate, is that the, the Russians have as many casualties, killed and wounded, seriously wounded, like 70, 80,000 people. That's from the conservative CIA estimate. So the Ukrainians haven't been that far off. When you think about that, that's half the force. Yeah. Well, it's more than that because... Half the force they started with, certainly. Well, how much of the force... Here's the thing. They started with how many? With 180, 200,000. Something like that, yeah. Right? 180,000. Is that right? Yeah, okay. How many of those people are support people? Well, it, that, it, it, that has to be at least 60 to 80,000. So they've lost virtually their entire fighting force. Yes, but I mean, it's probably it? fair to say that the Ukrainians... Are, wouldn't that... 
be true unless we, unless a lot of the people behind the scenes have been getting support have been getting knocked off. Yeah. The, 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 are hitting the supply depots. Sorry, and what? Are, the Ukrainians are hitting the supply depots now with these HIMARS. And that's one of the things that's probably going to cripple. So you have to include not only the supply, the fighting warfare guys, so the the war fighters, but you have to include the supply guys because they're also, getting hammered. at this yeah. stage. Well, that's equally thing, lethal to an army. Are, yeah, are hitting the the army decision centers. They do kill a lot of officers with HIMARS, yes. which is very excellent excellent strategy because on our side, I mean Ukrainian side. You can al always count on a deep, uh, deep back from, I don't know, from Poland, from, from Ukraine, from, from American uh, army volunteers, which are able to communicate with the Ukrainians. Russians are what? They're going to take Chinese officers? <laughs> North Korean? Are the, wh what's going to happen when winter comes? Because right now is even, OK, you've got a, you've got a couple of months for a counteroffensive before things start to get dodgy in November, uh, not only because it's dark, but also because things start to freeze um, and you start to get some bad weather, some snow. And if you're un really unlucky, it starts earlier in that part of the world, as other armies have found out in the past. Indeed. Um, do, you th do you think that's going to affect the, or how will it affect the Russian army? Because this time they're going to get some of their own medicine, aren't they? Yes. Yes. Yeah, go, sorry, go ahead, Nick. No, I'm, that's all I wanted to say. To, yes, how? How do you think it will affect them? Anybody? They're, it's going to slow down their movements and their supplies is going to be affected because the ground started to move. Uh, the ground is really going to play a factor. It's going to be really wet. As they found out in the first part of the weeks that they were into the offensive, tanks are getting stuck. Uh, vehicles are getting stuck. Personnel were freezing. They couldn't get warm enough. They were actually hijacking homes of individual citizens and trying to stay warm that way, but it's going to be effectively the same way. Uh, the Ukrainians are used to that. They're used to fighting in that kind of austere environment. The Russians are not. So it's probably going to fall into the Ukrainians' favor uh, because they do still have that. They're going to be able to push the Russians out because they at least gain some ground because of the supply issues that they are. As long as they continue to hit the depots, they will force a lot of the ground to be gained back. With Very the interesting. Wind. Yeah. And uh, the, if the Russians have ta been taking the amount of casualties that they appear to be during better weather, what's it going to be like when the weather gets really bad? They're going to be in big trouble. Where are they going to get their soldiers from? And what is it going to mean in terms of pressure on the leader, Putin, as well as the, uh, the Army general staff? Um, it's going to cause a lot of pressure, I think, and that could make things get, get pretty awkward, couldn't it? It could, although I, I, you know, we have to take into account the fact for that... For us, I mean. Yes, well, for us, it will, I mean, Putin is banking on the fact we don't like winter either. Yeah. So he's assuming or hoping... I mean, for us in cities with nuclear yeah, possibilities. They, yeah, but they, yeah. They say, I think his, his calculation is rather more straightforward. It's okay. with, with the lack of gas, the... And, and, and the winter coming, in Western Europe, people will start to think, well, hang on a minute, why are we freezing to death? Because of this war in Ukraine, we want our gas back. That's a very simplified form of, I think, what Putin is hoping for, that we, a combination of boredom and the cold climate will somehow crack the Western resolve to support Ukraine. Gosh, I, I mean, wish, I don't, I I don't wish think, I'd said that. That's very... I, don't, I mean, I hope that. I don't, I, I don't think that will happen. But, I mean, you know, that's, what, that's all about one of the few things he's got to hope for. But don't forget it, historically, in, in military terms, in a winter, general winter, has been one of Russia's great supports, because that's in the context of Russia being invaded, where yeah. you retreat, you retreat east, and the, and, the, and the invaders, whether it was the Napoleonic... Uh, armies or more, la or, more or, or, or Hitler's armies, they, they were the ones who suffered because they were ill-equipped. They were ill-equipped, But yeah. once the ground freezes again in winter, for moving heavy artillery, it becomes easier again because you've got firm ground. That becomes ground. easier. Now, Napoleon's people froze because they had no winter clothing. Yeah, and as did, as, as did as Hitler's. Did the Hitler's. Yeah, yeah. the uh, didn't, didn't move, and the, there were a lot of reasons. We can't go into that because yeah. we're ending up. That, that's yeah. a fun subject uh, to 
uh, I mean, an absorbing subject, if not fun. The, um, in, in the last couple of minutes that we have, I just wanted to ask a question and run it round. Everybody's got, you know, 30, 40 seconds. Uh, and that is, do the Chinese really want the Russians to win? No. No. No? no? Okay. <laughs> Nicholas says no. Go. 30 seconds. And then, and then all good, and then Anthony. Why? Well, because they don't like the Russians. Um, and and they, they, they probably don't want the dislocation either. The only advantage of the Russians winning is it might embolden the Chinese to attack Taiwan. But, right. But, but, but yeah. I think for the Chinese, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a, 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 a game whereby the Chinese have to win, but anybody else winning at anything is a blow to the Chinese somehow. Yeah. It, it provokes them. Um, and and the, the whole point about the Ukrainian crisis is the fact that the West has come together means it's a lesson to China that taking Taiwan, which military is not easy anyway, would also not be easy because the Chinese don't want to be, whatever they say, they don't want to be cut off from uh, the, Western, um, the Western markets. Okay, very good. Tony? I, I agree with Nick. I said no in the beginning, but it's not only just to be cut off on the Western market. They have a vested interest in the Silk Highway that they have been built recently. Uh, it's, it's going to be needing to be built through the northern parts of their countries, and with those allies, they need to make sure that they, well, those countries that are supposed to be quote-unquote allies, they're going to need to be at peace, and they do not want to continue with the building of the Silk Road if the Ukraine's at war. So that's also advantageous for them to have Russia lose so they can actually go into the Ukraine and help provide them infrastructure help. Olgerd, last word. You've got a minute. Same thing. I, I think not, because uh, right now I really doubt that China would do anything with Taiwan. It's their disadvantage. The, 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 the military that is present on Taiwan is pretty well trained. And I think they're going to, to be able to take out a lot of what Chinese army can, can send at them. And at the same time, for China, it's better to make Russia much weaker. Mm. America, despite all the problems it has, has proven itself pretty capable of handling those crises. And uh, Russia is going to be a piece of meat for them now. Very interesting. Okay, that's all we've got for this show. Thank you, Nicholas, for being in My the pleasure. studio, Nicholas Richardson. Thank you, Olgerd Uziembo, uh, as usual, Cogent Observations, and Anthony uh, McFarlane Gonzalez. Thank you, Tony, for being with us again, as always, enlightening uh, with this group. I'm very happy that you were able to join me today. A pleasure, as always. Okay. Yes. And thanks, everybody, for watching as well. And uh, may I say, you're looking well. Stay that way. <laughs>